Welcome to the New York Times Close Up. I'm Sam Roberts, and we're less than three weeks away from the critical Democratic mayoral primary, the winner almost certain to become New York's next mayor. The race still fluid and subject to a shakeup. We're talking before the Wednesday night live debate, but a new poll from PIX11 and Emerson College has former Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia jumping from fourth place to first with 21% in the poll. Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams is a close second. He has 20%, followed by Andrew Yang with 16 and Scott Stringer at 10. We should point out that the Times reports that none of the three major pollsters in the region has done any comprehensive surveys in the race. A sharp rise in violent crime has become a major issue with Adams and Yang in particular stressing their support for the police. But the big unknown as we head into the final days of the campaign is ranked choice voting. What impact might that have on the final outcome. We're talking today with Katie Glick, Times Chief Metro Political Reporter, and Clyde Haberman, contributing writer for the New York Times. Early voting in the primary is set to begin June 12th. That's pretty soon. And one thing that I'm struck by, uh, Katie and Clyde, is that in past elections, I always found a rationale to what the voters were looking at. And I admit to going way back on this. When I look at uh, John Lindsay running against, uh, running in the uh, late 60s, you had a period of the Eisenhower years with Bob Wagner and people wanted to change. As Murray Kempton said, he was fresh and everyone else was tired. And then after Lindsay, they wanted a beam because he knew the buck. And after he didn't know the buck so well, it caught show was a cheerleader for the city. And after that, in racial unrest, uh, uh, David D Dinkins, the first black mayor, seemed like the right guy. And Rudy Giuliani bringing law and order. And then uh, after 9-11, Mike Bloomberg. Uh, and then after a businessman, Bill de Blasio. What do you think people are looking for now? I can't figure that one out. Katie, what do you think? Uh, well, it's something all the candidates are certainly still trying to navigate, even though we are less than three weeks out at this point. You know, they are making pretty radically different facts about the answer to that question. Certainly, as, as you just laid out, we've seen uh, historically uh, in any number of elections, often mayoral elections are defined and, and answered by which candidate offers the sharpest contrast to the incumbent mayor. Uh, so you've seen a number of the candidates uh, this time around trying to position themselves as the antithesis of, of Bill de Blasio, uh, whether that is rooted in how they talk about the city, the extent to which they cast themselves as cheerleaders for the city, or whether it's rooted in how they talk about their experience headed into the office. Um, but certainly, I, we have seen some clear dividing lines between the mayoral candidates around questions of both ideology and the question of what kind of experience is needed uh, for the next mayor? Is it someone who's really rooted in city government and brings uh, a lot of that sort of more traditional government experience to the table? Or is the city in the mood uh, for a political outsider? And, and some people argue if that would require the city to be in a bit of a more risk-taking mood headed out of the pandemic. Clyde, what do you think? You've been around for a lot of mayoral campaigns. You've been abroad for some of them. Do you have any sense as to what the New Yorkers are looking for? They've obviously been very distracted uh, in the beginning of this campaign, but now it's coming up pretty close. Are people focusing at all? It's very hard for me to tell. And uh, your mention of ranked choice voting, of course, in, uh, at the start, just throws everything into a, a, a new kind of stew that we don't know. Will most voters indeed choose five people, rank five people, which they're entitled to. I'm not 100% sure that's necessarily going to be the case. Uh, we'll see. Uh, some people may just vote for one or two people that they like and let it go at that. And that's going to alter the mix entirely. I think crime is an issue. Uh, it's an issue in every big city during this pandemic. Murders have gone up anywhere from 30 to 50% in major cities all across the country. And we're no, no exception. And so I think that the law and order kind of rhetoric that one used to hear uh, in uh, uh, 
Giuliani years to some degree, early Bloomberg years, one that hasn't heard too much from uh, the present mayor at all, uh, will resonate for a lot of people. And then there's the eternal imponderable in New York. How many people will turn out to vote? We are notoriously lousy voters in this city. Uh, an occasional exception like last year's presidential election aside, our turnouts are in the area of 20, 25% in a good year. So uh, who those voters are, don't ask me. I'm not sure even the candidates and their, and their professional uh, advisors know. Katie, first of all, would you agree that law and order has risen to a major or the major issue? And if so, who benefits from that? I would agree that the questions around crime, around public safety, um, and, and sort of the debates around those issues have become absolutely uh, a central, if not the central issue in the race. Um, as uh, Clyde noted, you know, murders are uh, up, shootings are up, there have been any number of pretty startling um, crimes on, on the subway, you know, we've seen a spike in uh, anti-Asian uh, attacks and anti-Semitic violence, and, you know, certainly to put in context, we are, this is not a moment that is, you know, the same in terms of the numbers of, you know, perhaps where we were in the 80s or 90s, but but no doubt it, it is a moment that, that for a lot of uh, New York voters does feel a little different, does feel a little uh, more uncertain, and certainly where we were pre-pandemic. And uh, absolutely, it's become a big issue in the race, and, and we can see the candidates adjusting to meet that. Um, and, and what is striking, certainly, is that uh, of the four leading candidates, three of them are quite moderate, when relatively speaking, when it comes to issues of dealing with the police. Uh, Andrew Yang, Eric Adams, Catherine Garcia all support making reforms to, uh, to the police. They they support in efforts to, as they see it, reigning in police misconduct, but this is not the defund the police kind of crew. Um, and then Maya Wiley is running as a more progressive candidate. Um, she is certainly seeking to, she's seeking to create, as they all are, a broad coalition, but for her part of that, it includes an effort to emerge as a standard bearer of the left. And, you know, she is someone who talks more about cuts to the NYPD budget um, in, in a way that, that some of her other competitors don't. So um, we have pretty sharp contrast there. Among those other three moderates, is there any real philosophical, ideological difference uh, in what they would do with the police or what they say they would? So, you know, there, there are some differences about, you know, when it comes to the question of, you know, should there be a civilian police commissioner? Do you know, new recruits need to live in the city, not live in the city, um, broadly within the field? There, there's debates around those questions, you know, including among, among the more relatively centrist candidates. But it, probably the biggest distinction is around the candidacy of Eric Adams, who is himself a former police officer who, you know, as he would put it, advocated for change from within the system. He was, during his, his tenure as a police officer, a really uh, vocal opponent of police misconduct. He said that he was a victim of police brutality, but at the same time, uh, out of all the candidates in the race, you know, he is also among the most vocal in, in talking about, in his view, the need for police um, and, and perhaps more police um, in, in some instances on the subways, for instance, uh, when it comes to questions of, of combating public safety. So his candidacy just offers a really interesting test of the mood of the city on that question. Clyde, as you say, uh, rank choice is a big imponderable, uh, first of all, whether people even understand it, uh, then whether they'll take advantage of it and figuring out how it works, which I think many, uh, even among the cognoscenti, don't even understand fully. Uh, and then turnout, uh, obviously turnout is the factor, who turns out for which candidate. But what about some of the other things and which do you think uh, will turn out to be more important? Uh, union endorsements, editorial endorsements, uh, the money that's being spent, obviously debates, which we can't comment on yet. Uh, what do people decide uh, on? What On what basis, uh, whether they're looking for a woman, whether they're looking for a black or Hispanic or Asian candidate, uh, is there something uh, that defines a choice either generally or in this campaign in particular? Generally speaking, I think people tend to vote uh, toward their gender, tend to vote toward their ethnicity. It's uh, very common. It's happened uh, in election after election. So there is that skewed built in. I got to assume Eric Adams has a built in advantage among African Americans. Uh, Andrew Yang, I presume, has a built in advantage among Asian Americans. Uh, whether the same sort of thing applies to, let's say, Scott Stringer is Jewish, I, I, I can't swear to that. Uh, 
I, I think that people look for competence and who they perceive as being able to run uh, a, a city. I think this is going to work to Andrew Yang's disadvantage, if I had a guess. It's different than after 9-11, uh, the mood right now, where people turn to a total political unknown, Mike Bloomberg, uh, because they wanted somebody who knew how to run a large company and, and, and get our uh, affairs back in order. I don't think we're in that dire shape uh, anywhere near that. So I'm not sure <laughs> to the degree I mean, a question also worth asking is to, to whom, uh, who, who, does the, uh, who does this pandemic help more? And I don't think it helps uh, Yang in particular. Um, I think people are still gonna go with those they've tested before. I think Donald Trump is gonna help those who've held office before because especially in a city like New York that overwhelmingly rejected Donald Trump, it's going to be a city that I think is gonna prize having experience in government before. We've just had four years of a guy who was a total political neophyte. Look how that worked out. Uh, I think that's gonna be a common view among people. So I think those who've been around do have an advantage. Have they perhaps been around too long? We'll see. Uh, some of them uh, arguably have. I'm also curious to see how the, uh, the very old charge of uh, sexual uh, uh, aggression against Scott Stringer plays out, whether indeed it hurts them with voters the way it has with uh, folks like the Working Families Party and uh, other political uh, uh, forces uh, who dropped them immediately. And what to me, frankly, smacks of McCarthyism, the minute the accusation, which he denies, is made, uh, they turn away. Uh, we went through that in the early 1950s. Uh, and we'll see, there may be a backlash in his favor. Again, with in the absence of substantive polling, we're all groping in the dark a little bit here. Uh, Katie, in following up with uh, Clyde says, and I think that's a very good point, when you're comparing Andrew Yang to Bloomberg, uh, Yang uh, seems like a terrific booster of the city, but he also doesn't come with the same kind of business credentials that Bloomberg did. Uh, Bloomberg loomed after 9-11 like a potential savior of the city because uh, he was a competent businessman. He had those uh, kind of smarts or at least uh, uh, gave the impression that he did. Yang doesn't have that kind of record as a businessman. So does it appear as best we can tell that he is genuinely sliding in the polls from the position of prominence that he had, or is all of this more of the illusion from polls that really don't matter at this point? Well, uh, to first your point about the question of Yang's business record, that's something that uh, we have taken a look at quite closely, and, and he absolutely has a, a decidedly mixed record of success in the business and, and nonprofit spaces, and we, we did a whole uh, investigation into that. Um, but, so, but, but against that backdrop, you know, I think that throughout the race, it's the case that, that Yang uh, has stirred up a lot of excitement. He came into the race as something of a celebrity, He's a name ID, out on the campaign trail. Um, he is someone who uh, seems to energize you know, many voters who, who encounter him. And so um, so certainly wouldn't want to dismiss that. But, but at the same time, there, there is real evidence that, that he seems to think that he's slipping in the polls. And, and the best way to gauge that is how he's positioned himself. You know, for, for months, he positioned himself as this sort of above the fray front runner, and the optimistic cheerleader for the city who didn't want to engage in the back and forth. But we have increasingly seen him, um, like all of the rest of, or many of the rest of his opponents, you know, engage in negative uh, criticisms of, of, of some of his, uh, some of his rivals in, in you know, increasingly stark terms. Clyde, I won't uh, ask you whether you've made up your mind as to who to vote for, but what I have. Change, you have. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes I have. Okay. Well, what but would I... change your mind or what would happen in the next three weeks or so that would uh, lead you to vote for one candidate? You know, short of one of them shooting another on the stage, I can't imagine what. But I'm more focused than I suspect an awful lot of New Yorkers are on, on the race. So it was uh, relatively easy for me uh, to have my mind made up on uh, certain people. But um, if we are to believe that people do not begin to focus until just before uh, the, the voting starts uh, in the weeks before where we are now, 
then we'll, I, I don't consider myself uh, typical in that regard. Um, can, can I also, can, can, I mean, can I throw in uh, something else? What's also striking about this race is the other party, the Republican Party. This is a city, whether you like those guys or not, and they pretty much were all guys, this is a city that produced substantive uh, Republican candidates like John Lindsay, like Giuliani, like Bloomberg in his first race, like Joe Loda, like Fiorella LaGuardia for sure. Mm -hmm. And look who we've got now, Curtis Sliwa and Fernando Mateo, two clowns. Uh, the disintegration of the Republican Party in New York is uh, echoes uh, the one that I perceive on the national level in which it is uh, getting this close to brain dead. It really is quite pathetic. Katie, uh, I'll give you a break. You don't have to make a choice. Thank you both for joining us. Clyde Thank Haberman, you. Katie Glick of the New York Times. And coming up next, what is the NYPD doing about the surge in violent crime? We'll be back with that. We've been talking about how a spike in violent crime is now a major issue in the mayoral campaign. The statistics support the public's concern. Comparing April of this year to April 2020, official police figures show a 30% jump in the overall crime index, a 35% jump in felony assaults, a 28% rise in robberies, and a shocking 166% surge in shooting incidents. There's also been a surge in attacks on the subways, including several vicious slashings. The Times reports, quote, though crime is always a possibility on the city's subway, a recent rash of particularly vicious attacks on riders and transit workers has fueled fears that the sprawling underground system a mainstay of urban life is more dangerous than it has been in years and threatens to undermine the city's recovery. So what's behind the continuing spike in violent crime and what's the city doing about it? We're joined by Ashley Southall, the Times' police bureau chief. Ashley, thanks for joining us. And let me start off with a softball, if I might. Why is crime going up? It's not unique to New York, we know mm. that, but after these years of decline, which maybe we've begun to take for granted, why does it seem to be going up again? Is this an aberration post pandemic or uh, something deeper? Mm -hmm. The easiest and uh, most obvious explanation for the crime is that is the pandemic itself. The, the fact that we are so, isolated and that um, it, in many places, uh, the social structure and the social fabric has broken down, whether that's the closing of schools or of even community institutions, um, there's just not the structure to our lives that we had before the pandemic. Sociologists really don't know what the particular relationship is, that's something that they're still researching and finding out and may not know for years. Um, but they do, they know, they do believe that the pandemic did play a significant role because we see it nationwide, these rises, in, particularly in gun violence. So is there any feeling that as things return to normal, whatever the new normal turns out to be, as people go back to work, go back to school, uh, stores and restaurants, uh, other things open up, uh, that uh, rise in crime may abate somewhat? That's certainly what um, many people believe. In fact, um, we've already starting to see shootings um, not increase as much as they were doing last year. Um, last month, they were up about 85% compared to 2020, and now it's down to about 75%. So you see some of that easing off. The real test will be the summer months. About uh, two thirds of the increase in gun violence uh, last year occurred during uh, between June and September. And so the, the summer will tell us whether reopening is going to uh, help us pull back on crime or if we're in a, a new phase of violence in New York City. There was also a lot of reaction to uh, people thinking that we were too tough on crime, uh, not even the question of defunding the police, because I'm not even sure uh, there was enough of that to take effect yet, certainly in a place like New York. 
but uh, lowering uh, standards for bail, uh, making bail easier, uh, vastly reducing stop and frisk, uh, things like that that were conscious actions by the city, by the police force uh, that uh, uh, New Yorkers were reacting to and thought that the police had gone too far on. Is there any indication that those steps uh, might have contributed to a rise in crime? Well, the city had, the, the police have tried to blame the bail law for um, part of the rise in crime. But when you ask them for evidence, it's not really there on a systemic level. There, there are some anecdotes that people who are arrested for guns go out and get arrested again. Um, but those people, um, in, in fact, the courts are setting higher bail, more bail and higher bail than they were before the pandemic. And um, um, those people who are going out and getting guns aren't necessarily shooters. Um, and where we see um, a, a, something unchanged is that the NYPD isn't arresting many people who are involved in shootings. That's something that they are going after with these gang indictments, which were put on hold last year because um, it was really difficult to put together grand juries that could listen to these long presentations and, and deliver an indictment. Um, but that's, some, that's a key part of the city strategy going forward. Um, when it comes to uh, the stop and frizz, that program, when you look at it, was largely ineffective. Um, overall, those stops do not result in um, any criminal activity being found, any weapons of any sort being found. And so this, the, the city has decided there are better ways and more effective ways, and mainly through intelligence, um, to, to go after violence and crime. Uh, is there any indication why subway crime in particular seems to be going up? Is that because there are fewer passengers uh, or uh, less safety therefore in numbers or, or why? Well, there are a number of problems that converge on the home on the subway. There are there's homelessness, there's serious untreated mental illness, and then there was for a period the emptying out of the subways. We're starting to see ridership rebound on the subways, but um, we also we have not seen a an effective uh, a, um, program to address the serious mental illness uh, that uh, some people present often on the subways, and that is where the city is still searching for a solution. They have. Um, boosted programs that really target uh, in individuals who have had some contact with the shelter system, with the criminal justice system, and kind of go through the revolving door. Um, but but at, so far, it hasn't uh, abated the crime just yet. Is there any indication, and of course, we're speaking before the Wednesday night debate, that any of the mayoral candidates is offering something really different? different uh, than uh, their rivals and also different than what the de Blasio administration has been doing so far. Uh, they, they are certainly on a spectrum, but I think they, they're not that far from de Blasio, um, except uh, Eric Adams um, would like to bring reconstitute the anti-crime units whose main job was to go after guns. Um, the, the problem with anti-crime before was that uh, they, they, were, they were getting guns, but they were doing so in ways that were quasi illegal. And, and that re resulted in a lot of cases being dismissed or thrown out because they were um, because of technical violations. Um, what Adams would like to do is try to uh, reconsider who we put in those units and, 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 and see what they can do. Um, on the other hand, um, someone like Morales is more concerned with shifting money away from the police department, which is closer to the demands of the protesters who came out last year after the death, death of George Floyd to, to address the real social problems, the, the decay in the social fabric from even before the pandemic um, that, that led to the police having to deal with these issues in the first place. At this point with crime going up, could you make a good argument to defund the police or does it make more sense to refund the police, uh, maintain the amount of money going to it or even increase the amount of money, but use it more wisely to train cops better, for instance? It certainly depends on how you pick your data. With the Asian hate crimes, for instance, um, we saw that the city threw cops at the problem initially and um, they would send cops out as decoys in Asian enclaves and um, just wait to hear someone utter something or attack someone or attack even the cops. That 
as we see, has not stopped the hate crimes that we've seen. We've seen three, I think, in the last few days. Um, so now you saw last, uh, you saw recently when a mayor came out with uh, a group, a task force of civilian agencies that are going to look at this problem and who have been dealing with this issue, both for Jewish, for African American, for Asian American. And that's really what um, some of the, Asi the largest Asian American uh, coalition asked for in the first place. They wanted civilian safety ambassadors, they wanted education campaigns, and they wanted to train people to be active bystanders. Um, and so we'll see how that plays out. One thing very quickly I was struck by in uh, Maureen Dowd's column the other day, former Commissioner Bratton said Black Lives Matter, the organization is Marxist. Uh, he is totally sympathetic with Black Lives Matter, the movement. Uh, what did you think of that? I actually didn't read Marlene, Maureen Dowd's column. I mean, Black Lives Matter makes uh, no um, no attempt to hide their political leanings. They they do advocate for a non capitalist uh, stru societal structure. Um, so that that's nothing unusual. Um, Bratton's support for Black Lives Matter. I would like to hear him uh, elaborate more on that. I mean, he was the police commissioner um, when Black Lives Matter first came into being, and, and uh, we didn't hear from him on that. Thanks to Ashley Southall of the New York Times, and for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.